I'm Dr. Erin Carlos Diaz. I'm the curator of the Johnson Collection and welcome to TJC Gallery and to Dr. Leo Twiggs' Requiem for Mother Emmanuel. So this is the beginning of the series. This is number one of the nine. And again, I'd like to stress that we are going on a physical and emotional journey with Dr. Twiggs. So we will move from picture to picture. Uh, and essentially we are starting with this work, which uh, is Dr. Leo Twiggs's emotional uh, response to the tragedy, to the violence of the attack, and we will work through a series of nine pictures to end up at a place where Dr. Twiggs calls it a South Carolina's most shining or finding, a finest moment. So we can use this work to talk a little bit about his process, which is batik. So rather than using oil painting on a canvas, what we see here is the use of wax and dye on fabric. Uh, so batik is where you use wax to sort of plan out your designs um, on the fabric and the dye will resist that. And so Dr. Twix has been working throughout this process for decades and has perfected it to the ability that he is able to produce these wonderful sort of marbleized textures uh, in the work. And we will see that he uses this medium to uh, uh, great uh, extent and links uh, in some of his works. So as we look at number one, what we see is that front and center we have the target. Um, and this is to indicate that the church, the congregation of Mother Emanuel, the oldest uh, AME church in the south, was targeted by the shooter. We have something that is consistent throughout all nine pictures is the silhouette, this outline um, of the Mother Emanuel Church. And so that's something that's a way to sort of ground the series, to give you a sense of the place, uh, as well as to make it sort of a consistent narrative. What we also have here, and what's quite unusual for Dr. Twiggs's work, is this inset sort of recess. And so what we have here are a couple of objects. Uh, the interior is lined with velvet, meant to sort of indicate, say, a church pew. We have a cross to reference the fact that this tragedy occurred at a place of faith. And then we happen to have this small black object right here, which is what's called a mourning rosette, something that would be worn in the 19th and early 20th century at funerals. So what we have here then are objects that also give, it, give the whole work of art a sense of it being like a reliquary. Um, and so then as we move into number two, what we find now is that the target has been replaced with the Confederate flag. Uh, we then see the number nine uh, you, by using a stencil or a template. So it's consistent throughout. We also have nine X's to represent the nine victims. And again, we happen to have uh, the ever-present silhouette of the church. Now, something that's really important in this series is that Dr. Twiggs uses a lot of symbolism in his works, uh, and symbolism certainly in terms of numbers and the number nine. And what you might notice then is that there are nine stars on the Confederate battle flag. Traditionally, the Confederate battle flag actually has 13 stars. So Dr. Twiggs has deliberately altered uh, the flag to reference strictly the victims of the shooting. And then we move on to number three. And compositionally, it's very similar to the second work in the sense that the Confederate flag is front and center. Again, a reminder of sort of uh, the ideologies that would have encouraged the tragedy and the shooting. We have nine X's for the nine victims and again, the silhouette of the church. But what you'll note is that the picture itself is much smaller than some of the others. And in fact, the sizes of one through three are all sort of variations. Um, and so what happened is that up until this point in time, Dr. Twiggs was not consistently making a series. Uh, he was just simply working through the emotional trauma, all the complicated emotions that occur throughout the tragedy. And this work went up at auction at Spoleto. Uh, and it was at that point in time then when some of the larger public had a chance to see what Dr. Twiggs was making and producing. And they began to ask him, are you going to be doing a series? Are you going to be making a series of nine pictures for the nine victims? And he realized he had much more of a narrative to tell. He wanted to talk about this journey of reconciliation and forgiveness in South Carolina. And so this is sort of a pivotal work then to then think about how the, the body of work has changed from three individual objects to a series of nine.
And then we'll move to number four. Um, and so what we find here, uh, again, compositionally somewhat similar to two and three, but the Confederate flag is slightly askew, slightly off center. It's a bit smaller, but we do see Twiggs' ability to effectively use the medium of batik to get his point across. And so we see these splatters of red to indicate blood. We have um, nine X's in varying colors that sort of mimic the Confederate flag. Again, we have the outline of the church, but then what we also see uh, in the sort of indigo color is the emblem of South Carolina with the crescent moon and the palmetto tree. And so what we find, and what Dr. Twix is talking about here, is the aftermath of the tragedy, the taking down of the Confederate battle flag in front of the South Carolina State House. So as the flag is going down, South Carolina itself is rising up and above. And this is even more prevalent when we move to number five. And so at this point in time, we are now in the very middle of the series. Um, and we see now that the Confederate battle flag is more ghost-like, it's faded. Uh, in fact, the whole effect of the work makes you think there's almost like a sense of gauze or a veil over it. And what you do see is that this is the only work out of the nine that has a sort of calico print on it. There's this floral print throughout the whole work. And so that really adds to this ghost-like effect. And so the flag is moving farther down across the picture. The emblem of South Carolina is being, becoming more prominent. Even the architectural details here of a cross, of a window, um, are becoming more and more apparent. And so what we also see too is the way that the cross is positioned, or the, um, the way that the flag is positioned, we begin to see uh, the transformation into the St. Andrew's Cross. And this becomes so much more prevalent when we move into number six, where we see right here, now the Confederate battle flag has totally changed to a cross. This is another pivotal work, like number three. Uh, so up until this point in time, Dr. Twiggs had not visited Mother Emanuel in Charleston. And he felt that throughout doing this series, producing this series, he had to actually be in the physical space. Uh, and so he went and he visited the church and he spent about a day with the congregation. And something that he really noticed the moment that he walked into the church was the stained glass window on the interior. And so what he began to think about uh, was what it would be like for the victims to have been slaughtered in the middle of the church and as they were dying that they would be looking up at the stained glass window. And so what he has done in this picture is that he has then put you, the viewer, into the position of the victim in this case. Um, so what we also have though in this work, and something that you'll probably note, particularly in contrast to number five, is the vibrant color palette. We have rich purples, bright yellows, emerald greens. Um, so what we also see here though is a transitional work moving from tragedy to reconciliation, largely through um, a sense of faith. And so what we see here are the X's of the nine victims become crosses, and they're all sort of in individual colors. And there are nine, including this one here and the one up there. Um, but what we also see here, and this is, this is coming from a, a tour that I did with Dr. Twiggs as he walked me through these, these pictures. He told me that in African and African-American funeral traditions that they tend to be very joyful events, um, that you tend to wear a lot of bright, vibrant colors. It's not necessarily sort of the black, the traditional black that we would think about as, as mourning and in funerals. In fact, it's about a celebration of their lives. So this then is a transition from the celebration of the, from the victims to the celebration of their lives um, as individuals. So then we move to number seven, a work that really becomes <clears throat> an amalgamation of all of the kinds of symbols that Dr. Twiggs likes to use that we've seen throughout um, the series. And so we have the target that we started the series with. Again, just to point out that this is another case where Dr. Twiggs is effectively using dye uh, from batik. We can see the black spots that sort of mimic bullet holes. We have nine crosses. We have the number nine, again, as a stencil to make it very consistent, something we've seen throughout the series. We see a remnant of the stained glass. We see a sort of ghostly image 
of the Confederate battle flag, you can barely make out a few stars, but this also looks like a St. Andrew's cross. It also references an earlier symbol that Dr. Twiggs likes to use uh, throughout his work, which is a railroad crossing. He always likes to talk about uh, how we need to cross over certain obstacles, and certainly racism is one of those obstacles. The other aspect that I think is most interesting about this work is right down here with these um, 12 boxes, uh, three representing these empty boxes, three, those three represent uh, the survivors uh, from the tragedy. And that was something that Dr. Twiggs had noted is that uh, during the coverage about the tragedy, it was largely focused on the victims and not the survivors. So he wanted to give them some sort of presence in the series. And then we see nine X's here, again, representing uh, the victims, but this is the only instance throughout the entire series where he has physically used his brush with the dye to mark an X. Every other instance he has used a sort of template as a stencil. Uh, so I want you to sort of think about what it would be like as an artist to physically mark the canvas, sort of marking the spot, but also talk about being marked as a target. And then we move to number eight, a picture that is uh, so vibrant and really full of life. And we see that largely through composition, but also through the color palette. This is uh, an interesting work in the sense that the silhouette of the church uh, only takes up just sort of about half of the frame. Uh, in fact, it's somewhat almost divided equally here with this very strong line. Um, and so what we have are the nine crosses of the nine victims breaking through the earthly realm into the spiritual realm and sort of joining uh, a group of other crosses in this sort of spiritual or heavenly frame. Um, and then we have, it's hard to see, but we see a black sort of after image of the palmetto tree. We have the X's again for the victims, but again, we're talking really about their transition. And we also see a ghostly after image of that target that we saw in the very first work. And so something I always like to point out in looking at a work like this is to ask people where your eyes draw to first. What is the focal point? And in this case, it really is right here. It is that white cross against that royal purple backdrop that just pops and draws your eye there. You're also drawn through the composition, the peaks of the church, to this sort of exuberance of brushwork and color here uh, that sort of breaks through this harsh line. Uh, so it really is about a spiritual transformation here. And then we move on to number nine, to the concluding piece. Uh, where once again we have the silhouette of the church. We have the number nine in sort of a gray color, ever present, making sure that you remember the victims, even though we have come to a point of forgiveness and reconciliation. We have behind the church this interesting sort of tribal African motif pattern, uh, referencing the early sort of African traditions in the United States. This is a work that's also making a strong connection to the United States sort of deep uh, racial unrest and racial history, particularly in the South. Um, but what we have here are two sentences, two lines um, from James Weldon Johnson's uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing. And this later becomes the national anthem for the NAACP. Uh, but what we also have is that it, it, the words are placed over the sort of rust color that is almost reminiscent of dried blood in a case. Again, even though he's sort of saying in this work that yes, we have gotten to a place of reconciliation, a place of forgiveness where we have sort of put aside racial differences, we cannot forget the victims and we cannot forget the tragedy.